with the states were not. So if you look at this, and this is just public spend, so not private spend, just public spend. So public spend in Europe is 26 euro per head on cancer research. In the states, it's 10 times that. So yes, the cancer mission is going to make a big difference to that, but we still need to catch up. So it's, you know, we don't want to be too confident and say, oh, we have the money now, it's just what we do with it. But the other important thing is, is how do we invest that money? And one of the things we looked at is, uh, is the cancer research we do actually aligned with the cancer incidence and the cancer burden that we face in Europe? I'm just going to give you one example. Lung cancer. 21% of the disease burden in Europe, and yet it's only 4% of the research activity and the research spend. You can also see colorectal cancer, pancreatic cancer there. So we need to sometimes think about what, you know, what, what are the actual problems that we face, and they may be different in different countries, and then appropriately assign our, our resources um, to that. The other thing is really important is we need to work together. And I think you know, there's quite a number of people in this room who've been very much looking at that comprehensive cancer center model. And obviously, two centers are approved in relation to that. Other centers are on the way in relation to accreditation. So one of the things we showed, yes, definitely, this comprehensive cancer center model works in relation to the data. So not just saying this is a good idea, but the data is telling us that this actually leads to better outcomes for patients. But the one thing that we probably do very well in Europe is breakthrough. And the thing that we probably do not so well in Europe at all is follow through. And that's why I talked about implementation science. So sometimes we have great discoveries, but then when we actually try and translate them for the benefit of patients, they just don't work. So we need to look at investing more in health services research and implementation science, as well as focusing on precision medicine, diagnostics, et cetera. So we, but certainly comprehensive cancer centers seem to be the way to go. The other thing is we need to look at are we focusing on the right modalities? So if you look, surgery, pathology, and especially radiotherapy, we're spending far less in relation to research, significantly less. And yet, for surgery and radiotherapy, 50% of our patients, that's the way we actually cure them. So the other thing I say is pathology. If we don't have pathology, we don't have personalized medicine. So if we're not investing in pathology research, then we're not delivering. So each of these, we need to look at ways in which we can actually turbo boost the research in this area. These are the 12 recommendations. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but I will highlight number nine, where we said we really need a European cancer survivorship uh, research plan, because we don't have that at the moment. And a lot of the research is very much not focused on, not resourced appropriately, and not translated into benefit for patients. So in order to drive change, we're saying, here's the roadmap now. We've identified what the challenges are. We've identified you know, what the, the data tells us. We need to follow that data and make change happen. We feel that the patient can be very much a disruptive, positive voice in this. And it's very important that we work together. And that's why I'm delighted with the previous session and also the discussion that's been happening right around the room and outside in coffee. It's really important that we have a patient-centered approach. Uh, just uh, not, not touching on in this talk, but I think as well we have a responsibility as Europeans not just to look after Europe, but to look after low- and middle-income countries. And I think the U.S. and the United States really need to step up much more. Uh, sorry, the Europe and the United States really need to step up much more and look at low- and middle-income countries, where, after all, over 60% of cancers will occur by 2040. Thank you very much. I might ask the other panelists to join. Teresa, I know, is at the back, and yeah, Francis is here somewhere. So, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I was introduced earlier on. Tony Hulahan is my name. I know many people in the room. Uh, I'm very privileged to be invited to co chair this uh, session this afternoon. Um, uh, and I thank Emma and I thank Mark uh, for their thought-provoking uh, presentations. And as I sat and listened, I made a deal with myself that I wouldn't say anything, but I'm going to try and I'm going to fail. 
Um, I, I thought it was very interesting to hear both presentations. Obviously, I'm familiar with Mark's work. Uh, Mark and I worked together in the Cancer Forum when the Cancer Policy was put together, particularly 2006, and there are other people in the room who were part of that. And it is pleasing to see that Ireland has, as the evidence shows, improved its position in relative terms somewhat, which was part of our objective at the time, is to improve not our performance only in absolute terms, but also in relative terms compared to other countries. Uh, and my contention would be, if we want to continue, and I'm going to guess that everybody in this room wants to do that, to continue to improve our collective performance as a country and improve our performance, not just in absolute, but in relative terms by all of the measures that are important in terms of cancer control, then we're going to have to find ways of effectively collaborating across public and private, across institutions, across social barriers, uh, and across professional, patient, and other uh, delineations between us. And I think that behoves us to try to find a vision, which is more than just the sum of the individual institutions which make up our healthcare, but one national effort. And I was chatting outside to Declan, uh, who, who uh, very nicely talked about the idea of us all, as it were, putting on the single national green jersey. And I think that's the kind of opportunity that, that exists. And in my view, a little of a fork in the road, perhaps, in terms of where we might go in policy terms. And what we heard from Emma then was perhaps the kind of, if you like, excellence exemplar of how to think in policy terms about turning the reality of the challenge of cancer control at a country level into modern, effective, evidence-based policy. And there pr probably isn't enough pooling of that kind of know-how between countries. And I, I, I kind of know what I'm talking about when I say that. <laughs> So with those uh, few remarks, can I um, introduce uh, the panel members? And first of all, I have uh, Rosemary Gannon. Yes, hi, Rosemary. Uh, the ACRI project manager who also manages the HEA-funded ACRI Start program. And she's also involved in the establishment of the National Can Cancer Mission Hub, about which you've heard through the ECHOES project. Uh, we have Theresa McGuire, well known to me. Hello again, Theresa. Director of Cancer Research Strategy, uh, the Research Strategy and Funding at the HRB. Yasmin Fonseca, an international project manager with a proven track record of success and managing EU-funded projects in the areas of digital health research and innovation. And Francis Drummond, research manager with Breakthrough Cancer Research. Um, and so can I ask, in the first instance, just an open question. Uh, and I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind, um, uh, Francis. What? what Yes, just to keep you on your toes. We have we have a bouncer here beside us. I just want to just remind you of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so deco decorum required at all times at the top table. Um, wh what do you take from what Mark and Emma have had to say? Um, firstly, I agree with um, everything that Mark has said. I want to, I want to point out one or two other of the recommendations, though, from the grand shot, which is that we need way more investment in research. Um, and I want to point out, we, like, we've had wonderful talks today about clinical trials, but we need to also feed that pipeline. Um, I remember a, a, um, a post by Seamus O'Reilly about a year and a half, two years ago, that said if we implemented all the discovery currently into clinical trials, there would be 25% better patient outcomes. But that still leaves 75% of patients who require more discovery and understanding of the cancer processes. One other thing, um, I absolutely agree with Mark in that um, not all cancers are equal currently, and there is more investment required for those cancers which have huge burdens to the health system, to the patients, to um, not just in Ireland and nationally, but internationally, which are the lung cancers, the pancreatic cancers, the esophageal cancers. The seven lowest prognosis cancers um, account for almost 50% of all the deaths every year, not just in Ireland, but globally. So, you know, we've had great wins, and the great wins are because of investment in research. So this is necessary, um, and of course, we, we can't work in isolation. People have to work together. Um, so I agree with, with everything, but just slightly different emphasis on some of the things. Um, th thank you very much. Um, Theresa, if I might move on to you then, and somebody well familiar with the research policy environment, what role do you think research will, will play in policy terms in making some of this potential a reality? What are the, say, three or four really important things for us to get right to make that happen? Thanks, Tony. Um, first off, just to 
continue on from, from, from the answer to that question. I think what struck me, and particularly um, as, as, as Mark outlined it there in the last presentation, whether it be cancer, whether it be personalised medicine, whether it be dementia, anything that we look at from a research perspective in the HRB or otherwise, having a strategy, having a good strategy is great. Having a strategy is the first step. Um, and I think that's, that, that gives me optimism um, for cancer research. Uh, I, I, I think it's a gap in, in some other areas. Um, and I think having strong direction from right up to the up to the minister from a policy perspective, having a strategy that is revisited um, and where there's leadership around that, I, I think is first and foremost really important. Then from a research actor, um, whether it be the HRB that reports directly in or anybody within that space um, that has a role to play, you have something to talk about. I mean, dialogue is, 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 is what gets us here. People who are talking uh, about a vision um, and, and as the prior speaker said, starting with the end in mind. So if you have a vision, you have a policy, you have people around the table, you're off to a good start. And I think that, that's, that's really, really helpful. Um, I think, I mean, I suppose I'll, I'll make one point that might sound like a little bit off to the side, but it really struck me again today, as I do in other fora, that is um, cancer research in this instance sits within a research and innovation system with many actors in there. It sits within a healthcare system and a transforming and an evolving healthcare system. Um, and I think many of the challenges that bubbled up today, we would hear in other areas, because actually I think we probably need a separate mission uh, at political level, at government level, certainly led by the Department of Health, but not health alone, deferris and enterprise, to see how, what is our vision for how we sustainably and in a durable way bake research into our healthcare system. So I was really taken by the term health system innovation, which is your or an I system and your health system, but actually you pull it together. So I think f many of the issues that we talked about today, we've great people, we've great champions, as Professor O'Higgins said, we need to get behind them. We have a policy, we have a strategy. I think we start with thinking north south in mind uh, by default. Um, we all collaborate uh, and, and partner, but I think many of the issues that came up today, like electronic health records, digitalization in the health system, uh, do we have the equivalent of research offices um, in, in our healthcare system? What is our NIHR type level of funding and strategy? Those issues are really, really important to this discussion, um, but I'm more optimistic than I ever have been uh, uh, ar around that, um, and I think that's going to raise a lot of boats, particularly the cancer research community, because so much work has already been done on policy and strategy and people and leadership, um, and, and we have a really, really good, successful track record of competing in Europe, collaborating in Europe, and securing funding in Europe. So that's going to continue. We just need to get some of the other issues right um, nationally. Here, here. Uh, Rosemary, if I might come to you then, and just we've heard a lot about the absolute level of funding and about the relative differences between cancer types, between the different modalities of cancer treatment and so on. What for you are the kinds of challenges and the issues that we need to be uh, discussing and taking away to, 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 to uh, enhance our collaborative activity and research? Okay. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, so as you know, I've been very involved for the past three years with um, establishing ACRI and also I'm managing the HEA funded ACRI Start. So really a lot of my work is all about bringing people together and trying to get people to work together. And as you know, we're dealing with, while we identify different areas that need to be worked on, my main challenge is really, well, how do we do this? You know, who's actually going to go and do the work? Um, and um, I think um, since I've started to work with Professor Gallagher three years ago, I came brand new into this whole area of cancer research. I came from managing an environmental research project. And where I, my original background is in languages, I've no particular scientific background, but I think that's been one of the strengths because I've managed to connect with people, whereas I'm not threatening to them. I'm not like going to take over somebody else's job because I might not have that particular background. So I think sometimes people's skills are very important in trying to get work done and to deliver. So while we may recognize a lot of things for what we need to do, it's actually then to go to the next step of, well, how do we do it? So the challenge I have is to get people to work together, but then to get them to stay working together. 
and so then that's the way you can make progress and um, a lot of the work nowadays is done virtually is through like email is my main way of communication with people so it's um, you know then you're not really meeting people in, in person so it's trying to build up that trust uh, the relationship with people and how then can, can we can we work there from that so that's what my main challenge is and what I'm trying to do Thank you very much, uh, Rosemary. And if I can come to you, Yasmin, uh, we've talked a lot today about the, the idea of collaborating more effectively together and to try and perhaps create opportunities for us to uh, uh, get more, as it were, out of European funding, collaborative European engagement and so on. What advice and guidance from your perspective would you give us? What are the tips and tricks? Thank you. Um, the only advice that I can give you is on, as an um, ECOS project manager, we um, certainly, multi-stakeholder cooperation is a challenge. We have to tackle, to tackle uh, different cultures, this meaning mindsets, priorities, and values. And uh, as we saw today, we need multi-stakeholder cooperation to further implement the cancer mission, to further elevate our efforts, and to achieve the goals that we want to achieve. And so uh, I can tell you that we, uh, in ECHOS project, what we are trying to do and how we are trying to do this is by, uh, first of all, having an understanding of the European landscape. What is happening? Because uh, there's a problem here where, not a, pro a problem, but a challenge. And this is adds to the complexity of the project. Because, for example, uh, when uh, thinking about European at a European level, we have to understand, uh, for example, the Portuguese uh, issues we have to understand the Irish issues and so on. But uh, in terms of nationally, we need to understand who are the key players that we want to engage with, that we want to collaborate. And so within our project, what we are, t what we are doing is, uh, and we are starting now, we are only six months ahead of the project and we have 30 more. Um, what we are trying to do is actually uh, implement and develop um, customizable impact models. These impact models, what they will do is making sure that each member state can bring together to the table the key players, necessary players to, the disc to have discussions, uh, understand how can we uh, tackle the, road the roadblocks that we are trying to um, eliminate and just um, ensure that uh, stakeholders get engaged on the long run. And so um, this, is, uh, this is what is what we are trying to do. And this is exactly why we are not rushing our partners to establish uh, national cancer mission hubs by now, because we really need everyone's expertise to uh, develop these flexible, customizable impl uh, impact models so that with the expertise of all together, we can then bring this to our nations and do the best as, as we can. And so I can also give you the example, for example, um, nationally, Portugal is one of the countries that uh, integrates the consortium that already has a national cancer, a national cancer hub, not mission oriented yet. But um, for example, we, were, uh, we had resources, very scarce resource, resources, and we wanted to bring together stakeholders to work with us. What we did was actually um, open a public call for expression of interest. So all of um, key players that were working on the cancer domain in Portugal could reach out to us because us doing that research would be very demanding in terms of resources, uh, costly, and also uh, human resources. And so what we did was to open this call for, for expression of interest and we were able to garner, I can tell you, more than 400 stakeholders to work with us. We have um, filtered them, so in terms of expertise, interests, and also what can bring, uh, and also national influence, because this is what we are trying to do, and I love um, an expression that our coordinators use a lot, is that we need to work together, and working together is increased impact by decreasing efforts. So I believe this is very it. Nice. Good. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yasmin. And you mentioned uh, the term uh, key actors, and I looked over at Ristar to give him a clue that I was going to come to him first. Uh, Ristar, do you want to say anything in the first instance, just from the audience, and maybe then others? You might raise hands if you'd like to make a contribution. Uh, thanks very much, Tony. 
I, I think, I mean, I just want to congratulate everyone that's involved in the day because, uh, as I said at a pancreatic meeting in Cork on Friday, uh, we have to work together. And actually, Ireland has advantages because it is a compact community, albeit on the periphery of Europe, but it is compact and it's not too big. It's five million people. And there are a lot of really wonderful scientists, doctors, administrators, public health doctors, working in our system, nurses, really great people. And it's to bring it together. But I was kind of contemplating resources is one of the things we talk about. And of course, we're constantly going to the Department of Health about resources, but that's not the only thing at all. And I guess there are two challenges that I see immediately coming down the tracks to us uh, about working together. One of those is the development of the regional health areas. And that's these are going to be, they've recruited the uh, are there, they've put in the ad in the paper, if any of you are interested, for, to become the uh, uh, executive officers of these regions. But we have to ensure that something like the National Cancer Control Programme is maintained and strengthened in the face of that. But that's a difficult challenge, because currently it's in the HSE, it's within the system, and it's actually been demoted in the HSE over the years. And it is vulnerable, and I think the room should know that. And really, if we can't get the cancer control program to maintain, not for me or for individuals or for anyone, but if we can't maintain that, as Mark has pointed out, this is a very, it has delivered. Uh, and uh, if we can't maintain that and make sure that that has an influence on these semi-autonomous regions, we're gonna be in trouble for cancer whatever investment we put in. And the second challenge really is around the fact that somebody mentioned we had a lot of cancer centers, which we do, maybe too many for our size, but we are where we are. And we have a lot of medical schools and a lot of research institutions, but we are where we are. And to bring those together, we have the OECI, which is fantastic from the point of view accrediting institutions, bringing the scientific component of an institution and the clinical component together, which is what's happening in all our cancer centers. But if we just have these multiple OECI cancer centers in this country and they're not working together, because particularly our OECI cancer centers are going to be very small compared to international units. So we need them to work together. So that's a second challenge. And they're fundamental outside the challenge of the financing. Thanks. Uh, Liam. Yeah, I, first of all, Eva, thanks very much for the presentation. And I was delighted uh, that you could kind of give that story because it's for me, you know, we need examples to look to. And I suppose my question is, what was your argument, your kind of business argument to the, you know, the funders for that program? Because as far as I know, it's like a five-year program, three, three million euro, whatever it is. What's the argument to the funder? But also, what, what do they get out of it for the, the funder, but also the ecosystem? H how do you sell it to the other parties? What do they get out of it? Okay, so, well, I think... Um, so, so far it's been, I think, coming back to this with the coalition of the women, those have shown very much interest in being partners, uh, in different ways to be partner, is because they have um, a business model that aligns with wanting to, to improve uh, health and the society at large. So it's, it's, it's a drive also fr from a company's perspective to, to invest and improve, not only in, in, um, in treatments, but also in the preventative side. So it's, I think it's also about um, shared values, uh, uh, really aligning it to the Agenda 2030. So it's also for many organizations, whether they're public or private, it's part of their own um, uh, corporate social values and also to be a, a, an attractive employer, you actually engage in new ways. So I think that is, that's important and also um, we got the initial funding from the innovation agency in Sweden wanted to try new models of collaboration. So it's, it's been really about funding that, how do you create new ways of working together that could be sustainable over time. And now we're in, in our sort of final four, fifth year, we'll start now with this sort of seed funding that is topped also with a lot of in kind of pro bono for many, many partners and actors in the system, not only private industry, but also from other charities and um, 
societies and medical societies, but it's also about a lot of in-kind time to actually work on different questions, uh, plus funding for workshops, for producing reports, a lot of producing the evidence and the data to drive forward different initiatives. And we decided to start somewhere that we could al align also on the needs, lung cancer. We said there are so many challenges and opportunities. It's something that no single actor can solve on their own. So, uh, so we have invested in, in reports on making sure that we have a national um, a review of the value of early detection screening so and health economic assessments. Uh, we've also made even like opinion polls in the risk population about attitudes towards screening, for instance, other early detection research investments. So I think it's, it's again about di finding different priorities and not everybody will align on the same priorities. So that's why it's good to start different initiatives where people will align, but we also think it's important to, to broaden. You need to connect different ecosystems. This is a lot about working uh, in initiatives uh, across the society, but citizen also with, with schools, with other business sectors. You need also to combine different missions. So, because this is about creating a better society and to live in, ultimately. So I think you start off in the sort of core of the cancer system, but then you have to broaden and find models going forward. Thank you very much, Emma. I'm going to come to Michael Kern and then I'm going to come back to Mark. I'm just conscious of our time. <coughs> just, I was going to ask Mark a question, but just as a prelude, I would like to say, just to follow up on what Richard said, it's hugely important in an environment where one in two of us get cancer in our lifetime and one in three die from it. I think one of the most important things that's happened in my lifetime in this country is the National Cancer Control Programme and having lived through a situation where we set up breast check and I was the lead surgeon for it in the matter. When I went west, we didn't have a breast check program nearly 10 years later. It just goes to show what can slip if the concept of a national cancer control program is let fall apart, you know, and it has been tremendous. But one of the issues around that, I think, that the minister and others need to be aware of is that for a research-led, physically functional cancer environment, you need to have fit-for-purpose research environments in our hospitals. So we've got to develop a cancer structure and strategy and infrastructure within the hospitals where people have access to healthcare professionals, nurses, clinical trials, biobanking, that sort of an environment. And that needs to be across those eight cancer centers, which, you know, Richard is saying may be too many, but it's not a bad start in the context of the number of hospitals that were treating cancer in 30 years ago when I started out. So I, I do think we've made great progress, but it would be easy for that progress to slip. And as you said, Mark, data trumps opinion, um, eats opinion for breakfast or whatever you, in that environment. Just in the context of cancer preparedness and our data, where are we at, would you say, as somebody who's got a view on what's going on across Europe and the north of Ireland and what's happening here? And don't tell me that we just need an electronic health record or an electronic or a single patient the, identifier. The minister has solved that. Yeah, no, but from the, from the point of view of where do you think we're at, if you were to give us a kind of a one-minute overview? Yeah, really strong in relation to the cancer registry, but I would say that, say that because I sit on the uh, cancer registry advisory board, but no, that's really important. So in terms of the cancer registries, actually, if you look at both cancer registries in Ireland and Northern Ireland, both very strong, and that's providing the evidence into the International Cancer Benchmarking Partnership that they're, we're then using to potentially influence policy. Um, I think in relation to some aspects of digital health need to be improved. In, in both jurisdictions, but probably we're slightly ahead in the north and certainly in the UK. We've really invested, Health Data Research UK is the National Institute for Health Data Research, and that's been a significant investment. We've just uh, invested uh, one another 72 million in relation to that program. So I think there definitely needs to be much more investment in data and using data to inform. So for example, I'll give you an example of a very practical and it goes back to health economics, which is an important part, which I don't think we focus on enough in this country, in relation to making the case, not sort of saying you can't do this, but saying you can do this. Uh, we looked at um, treatment breaks for colorectal cancer in England, and what we showed was that actually not only did it make sense from a health uh, perspective in relation to having uh, less uh, complications, but it also made significant difference in relation to the cost for each patient, and that's what actually won the day in relation to NICE changing their advice in relation to uh, 
bowel cancer in terms of treatment breaks because they were actually dead against it. And we had to fight this with Bowel Cancer UK for about three years, but the critical piece of evidence was the health economic evidence that we generated. So it, it goes back again to that sort of, you know, data trumps opinion in terms of you, you really need to have the data because then it's if you look at France is a brilliant example of molecular genetics so France decided that it was going to look at ways in which it could introduce um, molecular testing um, for cancer and it did it first for EGFR testing and um, as the uh, one test so what it did was it made the economic thing that if you treat everybody the same way it costs this much if you only treat the people who actually have EGF or mutations, it costs this much. That m difference was enough to actually fund 28 uh, laboratories around France that were able to do that test. You then were able to layer on, that was for one test. That was cheaper than actually giving everybody the chemotherapy in terms of the old sort of, you know, uh, a blunderbuss or a one, one size fits all approach. Then they were able to layer on top of that, the second test, the third test, the 50th test, et cetera. Um, so that, but that was made up front in terms of a health economic assessment. Can I just add one thing as well, what we are trying to do is not only, not only in our practice to say to deliver on the national cancer strategy, but also aligning it with other national strategies that are of importance to actually make this change happen. So we have a, this with life sciences strategy, which is actually like a joint venture between our Ministry of Health, Ministry of Enterprise, and, um, and the Ministry of Education, because you, you have to entail this together, and also with the exports and investments, which is also that's a lot of potential for the SMEs and for larger companies, so that they see a lot of opportunities also for having a sustainable society at large to, to deliver this world-class public cancer. This is really important in terms of what um, Liam said earlier on in relation to ACRI, in relation to the, the research and innovation piece. So I'm gonna ask you a question. University of Cambridge is the second number two in relation to spin-out companies in the UK in terms of university. Who's number one? So University of Cambridge is number two. Who's number one? Queens. 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 For the last two years. Congratulations. Now, I'm going to come back to my co-chair colleague. To, to Queens to is Queens. Uh, I have, we have to finish, but I, I just wanted to say, just to come back to, and this is quite a serious point, just to come back to what Ristard said about the NCCP, we shouldn't be scaling down in any way from the NCCP's point of view. Uh, I'm taking my liberty here as chair. We should be scaling up. Um, and when we, you know, when we listen to like the health research, we wouldn't be here in Cancer Trials Ireland without the health research board. We wouldn't exist. The health research board gave us our first grant. We, we were able to start running clinical trials and we've built, it's now 20% of what we get. The Irish Cancer Society actually fund us more than anyone else in the country to do what we do, but that's not good enough. It's, it needs to come through the health service and it needs to come through the NCCP at a national level. So I think it should be scaling up, not scaling down. That's a really, for me anyway, I'm going out of here with a very important message that we're going to be advocating on because there's a lot we would not have been able to do without your support, Ristard, and, and the team. And, and just in, in supporting that, and I was involved in some of the work that led to that, the establishment of the first instance and know what it was based upon and all of that and the potential that, was, that we were attempting uh, to realize. And the final remark that I'll make in terms of everything I've heard over the course of the day, uh, perhaps to not suggest that we should be thinking about just going to the department to find out what the vision is. There's enough people in the room here with a singular sense of purpose to try to find a way of articulating that together. And the department will follow and support a sensible consensus. If there's a consensus collaboration built across the community in this country, it will be powerful. So thank you all very much. Okay. So um, I'm going to slightly contract session five, but it's very, uh, I, the last speaker, as first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, session four. So thanks very much for that. We're going to quickly move forward. Thanks very much for two chairs. So our last speaker is um, someone who has been extremely helpful to the Irish re research ecosystem, uh, Kay Duggan Walls. Um, Kay is currently a seconded national expert policy officer within the European Commission and most recently was working for many years in the HRB and hopefully we'll come back after your secondment to the HRB and, but ultimately she's working currently, sorry just a bit of quiet there, so currently she's working in the combating diseases unit within the EU cancer mission and uh, also is um, a key responsibility in terms of supporting the ECHOES pro project. So I asked Kay to give a short talk on 
I suppose, the expectations from the EU for the uh, national cancer mission hubs, but also give us an idea of what's coming down the track. What are the key programs that are potentially of opportunity? Sometimes we might have missed a boat, but another key part is, can we influence the system? And again, I think you're going to comment on this later, Kay. Become an expert. The best way to learn about the EU system is register your name on the expert database and get involved in evaluations and see how those programmes are evaluated. So thanks very much, Kay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Liam. And thank you for inviting me to speak at your Cancer Mission Day today. And it's a great initiative to bring the Cancer Mission uh, regionally, uh, nationally and locally. And uh, we in the European Commission are delighted that today's event is taking place. And I'm also pleased to be here, as Liam said, one of my responsibilities is uh, supporting the ECHOES project, um, and um, which implements the Cancer Mission Hubs, is what we're talking about today. And I would like to wish you uh, the best of luck in developing the, the Cancer Mission Hub, and, and it's not going to be an easy task. Um, and you have our support in, in doing this. And also we want your feedback on how you have, um, how you're getting on or how it's going to go because it's very important for us in the, in the commission to be able to uh, learn from all the experiences. And as we have seen as well today, inspired by the cancer mission, several member states have already set up mirror groups, uh, Spain and Sweden and Belgium replicating at national level um, the integrated approach to health and research policies and investments um, and uh, they're starting to, um, RNI is starting to become more prominent in national plans for cancer. So my first slide, oh, I have to go back I think, no, this way, no, no oh, there we go, sorry, no. Uh, so my first slide is about the cancer mission governance and just to, I suppose, let you know where the, um, the national cancer mission hubs are situated. And you see that we have the R&D mission, R RTD mission secretariat is where I work. Then we have HIDEA on the left-hand side and they implement, they're the executive agency who, who implement the projects uh, for the European Commission. And then the ECHOS project is, um, the project that will implement the national mission hubs. And, um, sorry, okay. So this is, and I think uh, Amanda uh, mentioned some of this earlier, and it's about the uh, EU level governance of the cancer mission. And so we have a dialogue with member states. We have a subgroup on cancer on the pub, under the public health expert group, uh, which follows jointly the implementation of the European beating cancer plan and the cancer mission and the health and research ministries are um, represented here. And it allows the health and research authorities to work together on issues related to the implementation of Europe's Beating Cancer Plan and the Mission on Cancer. And in, we also have a stakeholders uh, dialogue, we have a stakeholders contract group uh, under the EU health policy platform as well. And this is a basis for discussion and exchanges with stakeholders on cancer. And then there's internally in the European Commission, there's um, an implementation group, and this is a dedicated group uh, gathering different commission services to ensure that actions, policies, and findings are aligned across the relevant commission departments. So one of the things that Liam had asked me to talk about was how, uh, the, what's the expectation of the cancer mission, and the ECHOS project, which will implement the cancer mission hubs, um, how that will um, help member states. So our expectations are that it'll help align national region and regional cancer RNI programs and national cancer plans towards EU priorities. Uh, it'll bring cancer stakeholders and citizens together for regular engagement in cancer related activities. And it will also facilitate cooperation between research and innovation and healthcare ministries to enhance meaningful outcomes for citizens, including those at risk of cancer and living with and beyond cancer. And it provides a network for long-term collaboration on the cancer mission and Europe's beating cancer plan and national initiatives. And it also will facilitate peer learning and sharing of best practices. So this is what the ECHOS project is expected to do. 
and many of those items there would have come from the call that was in the work program when they applied for it. Um, then the National Cancer Mission Hubs, uh, what our expectations are, um, and this is to raise awareness of the cancer mission uh, to national, regional and local actors and citizens. And it's about putting the citizen at the centre of R&I policy um, and secure buy-in and engagement of different stakeholders as well, both public and private stakeholders, uh, to involve stakeholders and citizens in cancer-related policy dialogues on cancer prevention and control uh, at EU and national level, but also at region and local level. And the region and local level is quite important for the cancer mission. Um, and that there's regular engagement um, and bringing together uh, people and uh, to foster uh, policy um, dialogues and and also looking at where investments are needed in, in, in cancer in nationally and locally and then the other one is about sharing best practices and success stories among mission hubs and this is one of the things that the ECHOS project will do when uh, the different mission hubs have been set up in the different countries they look to see what the best practices are uh, they will develop joint activities between national actors and mission hubs across countries, uh, monitor cancer rates to see uh, future improvements, to see what the rates are in the different countries, and provide feedback and evidence on policy actions at EU level. Um, and also they will enhance member states' capacity to integrate EU research, cancer research and policy actions at national, regional and local level. So, um, I was also asked to talk about future opportunities and um, the results from the 2023 calls um, are n not yet available because the grant agreements are being um, agreed with the coordinators who have been successful in 2023. And then we've had a delay on the 2024 work program because there was an assessment and review of all of the five missions and uh, they have been successful and the reports have been published recently. Um, and I can send the links uh, later on to Rosemary because I hadn't included it here. But for the 2024 work program, which we're working on, um, there, uh, it, the, the budget is similar to the last three years. It's about 124 million euros. Um, and what we're doing in this work program is bringing forward um, programs that were in the previous work program, such as the uncan.eu digital platform and also the patient digital center, so there's calls in that. And as uh, Amanda spoke about earlier, about the, uh, there's a call on late effects in adolescents and young adults with cancer. And it was as a result of a number of workshops that we had with them and a conference that we had uh, last year. Um, they've come up with um, the kind of things that they want research in. Uh, and there was a very long list, so we have to be uh, we, uh, mindful of what, and uh, not to, uh, I suppose, over, a promise as well, uh, only we can only do a certain amount. Um, so the draft of the work program is in development and um, yeah, there was two other, sorry, two other areas that I uh, meant to cover was uh, as well that um, there is a topic on genetic and genomic risk predictors and there's also one which I think might be very important for uh, charities, uh, cancer charities in Ireland and it's about uh, using, uh, bringing together cancer charities uh, to work together and supporting those charities to carry out clinical trials. And I think that's an important opportunity. Um, and we've been working with cancer uh, charities. Um, we have um, stakeholder meetings with them on a regular basis, but it'd be good to get the Irish uh, charities involved in that group as well. Um, and you have an opportunity then to be involved in this, uh, in this call. So we're supporting the, the, the money uh, that the, all the charities have to, uh, to have clinical trials, run clinical trials. Um, so, yes, the, the work program is being developed and the, the call will probably open in the end of March or early April, but I advise you and strongly suggest that you contact the national contact point, um, Irene, and uh, talk to her about what's coming up. And we've had a number of meetings with, we have a, a cancer mission working group, uh, which the HRB and Enterprise Ireland are members of, and this is where the the work, uh, the topics in the work program are discussed, and this is where you can influence the work program. So we've had a number of meetings um, on the 2024 work program, but we're going to have in October another workshop with them, and it, we'll be looking at 
future, developing future work programs. So I would advise you to talk to Patricia Clark and to Irene and Martha Cahill in Enterprise Ireland. And you can uh, give your ideas then uh, as to what should go into the future work programs. Um, and just to give you an idea of some of the activities that the cancer um, mission is involved in, um, tomorrow there's going to be uh, a meeting in Gastein. Uh, it's about boosting mental health of young cancer survivors and the <coughs> European Commission are taking part in that. Uh, there's an EU workshop in environment and childhood cancer on the 6th of October in Brussels. Um, there's the European Week of Regions and Cities and there's going to be a session on that on National Cancer Mission Hubs um, and the ECHOS project are going to be um, taking part in that. And um, it's only an in-person event only, which is a pity because there are lots of very, it's a, a full week, but the, um, the, the ECHOS uh, session will be on the 12th of October. Um, and then there's a conference on personalized medicine, uh, the evolution of healthcare to improve people's lives on the 4th and 5th of October to do with the Spanish presidency. But there's a satellite session on cancer, on the cancer mission. Um, and um, my colleagues in Hadea, which is the executive agency that manages the, the, uh, the calls and the, um, the projects when they are funded, have asked uh, me to talk about, they're looking for experts and um, to join, to assist in the evaluation of grant applications and projects. And it's a great opportunity to learn how applications are evaluated, what, what's needed in an application when you're applying. And also you'll get to meet other people from other countries so that you can start and have a, a, you know, a basis of a consortium perhaps on, on some of the projects and registration takes about 30 minutes and the database is used by the whole of the commission and there's the link there. So they're looking for clinical scientists, oncologists, preclinical scientists, experts in uh, social sciences and humanities, experts in, uh, in AI, patient advocacy groups and oncology nurses. So they're the, the kind of people they're looking for. And because they get so many applications, not just in cancer, but in all areas of health, they're looking uh, regularly for a, a, a lot of experts. And my final slide, I think, it's um, just some links. Um, so the, the implementation plan is online and there's a link there. To, so this is where the, the cancer mission is going into the future. So we've covered some of the things, but there's lots of things there that we haven't covered and we'll have to cover those over the next few years. So this is where you get an idea of, of what's happening in the cancer mission. And then the next uh, link is, is just the website for the EU Cancer Mission. And there's a leaflet as well. And on that leaflet, it's on that website, you'd find examples of previously funded projects uh, from the Cancer Mission. And I've left some stickers out on the table and there's a, a, a link there where you can click onto that and you will come into that leaflet. And the final uh, link is the conference I was telling you about on the um, addressing the needs of young cancer survivors. Uh, that's on YouTube. So um, thank you very much and good luck with your uh, developing your cancer mission hub. Thank you. Uh, Kate, I'm just wondering if uh, there's any burning questions from the audience. So like that was a great overview. And again, I would encourage, we, we will share the slides to everybody. Uh, like, okay, we'll share them for, if we're able to in terms of contact list. If we can't, we'll, we'll contact people, or we'll, we'll uh, contact us and we'll circulate the, the um, slides. So is there any burning questions about Kay's talk? No, so I would like to, yeah, sorry, go ahead, I just, I just wanted to say that, you know, because I'm on secondment in the European Commission, uh, this is your opportunity to have a contact there, you know, and because it's a link between both the, you know, the European Commission and the Irish um, scene. So I think to make use of these contacts, and that's why we're seconded to the Commission. Um, so thank right. you. And I'd just like to make a point that, again, uh, Kay, um, Amanda, Arini, Patricia Clark, Martha Cahill, we have very, we have fantastic national contact points and supports uh, that a lot of researchers have used. Uh, and I think a key part, I think, the message I was trying to get across today is, if the opportunity is not for you, we'll pass it to a colleague in another institution. Right, don't just, you know, this is what we should be doing from a cultural point of view spreading the opportunity around because that's part of the challenge is knowing the opportunity and spreading it around you know you know sometimes it's caught in a bottleneck of one or two people 
and we need to become better at disseminating the relevant opportunities because, you know, nobody can really scan 120 pages of text and find something useful for them. But you know who, who in your community who could benefit from that program. So I think that's, that's culturally we need to get better at that. We need to come up with a mechanism of disseminating the opportunity to our colleagues. It doesn't have to be in your institution. It could be in another institution. It's from an Irish, Ireland incorporated, the green jersey uh, perspective because we'll all be better from that. Uh, so Irene, I don't know if you had any comments because I've, I've, I've shortened that, that session, but I don't know if you had want any last comments or from, from that perspective, from, I, 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 yeah, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, very quickly, just to encourage everybody to really use these opportunities. So Ireland has a very good track record so far in the cancer mission, but it's a very young program. We've secured four to five projects per year, and we are participating, but we are not leading on anything um, so far. So it makes sense in some of the projects that we are not leading, but we have to look at where we have strengths, and I, I think we can lead in some of these. So yeah, just some um, encouragement maybe to all of you, work more together and find those people that you know can, can lead in something um, and try to bring some of more funding to cancer research in Ireland. Yeah, and I think this is an important point because in the past we have been leading programs. So uh, uh, a very good colleague of mine also had the unfortunate experience going through my lab, Annette Byrne in the Royal College of Surgeons. She's been the coordinator of four or five big programs. You know, there's multiple examples in the previous framework of Irish leadership of EU programs. That's not happening at the moment. So because the nature of the system, the ecosystem is changing, this is why this day is here because we want to build critical mass such that we can actually pre prepare and lead programs. Like, I was really incentivized by the leadership of Portugal in terms of the, the, the ECHOS program, because normally it's, it's France, Germany, uh, now the UK will come back in, but ultimately it's normally a small number of entities, countries, large countries, that, that tend to drive these programs. So it was great that Portugal was leading the ECHOS program. So just, uh, just a last minute, just or two, just to thank a couple of people, and then we go for networking. So again, I'd like to thank um, uh, particularly Minister Donnelly for, for coming. Uh, it was great to hear. It was really nice to hear our Minister of Health, you know, just, just talking about, at length about cancer research. So I was really delighted. And tomorrow morning, we actually have uh, uh, Minister Simon Harris, who is the Minister for Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science, which is very important as well. And I agree, we need not just the Department of Health, we need other relevant departments connected together who's also given a keynote tomorrow uh, uh, as part of the ACRI workshop. All our wonderful speakers and panel members, se session chairs, um, the ECHOES project members who were participated. Uh, and again, we had online, I think uh, Chantal is over there busy, very busy. Uh, she's been kind of giving me an update on numbers, but we've had between 100 and 200 people kind of subscribing online throughout the day. So that's great in terms of participation. And again, going forward, it can be challenging to do hybrid meetings, but it's really critical, I think, in terms of, it's great to have in person, but it doesn't allow everybody to participate. So I think hybrid is, is the way forward. Um, I'd really like to acknowledge the ACRI team uh, and the NCCP. So on the ACRI side would be Dr. Rosemary Gannon, Shantan Halley, um, um, and, and also on the NCCP side, Oslan McDonald, Ruth Ryan, Kira Mellet, I thank Donald and, and Richard for his great support of the ACRI program as well. All the volunteers who have helped today, the Herbert Park Hotel, Magpie, and uh, my daughter and her two friends as well. So, uh, so <laughs> they're probably going to give out to me afterwards anyway, but so what? Uh, who, who are here for their TY experience. So uh, uh, thanks very much, everybody. And let's enjoy a bit of uh, celebration outside. Okay, thank you.